Okay, a couple of things to start with. Um, so, this is an old page. Old page. I didn't download it. Let's go. So, uh, <clears throat> these are our TAs, and uh, listed alphabetically. Uh, Amar will hold a survival help session Friday night starting at 5 o'clock in this room. It's just for people who are struggling. I've asked him if people start asking sophisticated questions, refer them to me. Uh, I don't want people that know a lot asking complicated questions while the people who are struggling get blown away. They don't know what's going on. I, this this Friday evening help session is for people who are, you know, struggling to catch up. So if you fall in that category, please attend. Okay. Uh, the other three guys, right now, they will all be in this room from 5 to 7 on Tuesday night. Okay. Uh, I don't know that they'll be here tonight. I hope they will, but I uh, uh, forgot to send them an email asking them to be. Okay. So, uh, but uh, certainly starting next week, they will. Now, uh, I may, one of them, I may move to another time. Is, uh, can everybody make Tuesday night at 5 o'clock uh, in this room? Is there anybody who can't make it? Okay, looks like it's probably going to be okay. So one of them may move. But anyway, the model is that, um, you know, there's uh, two or three of them here. And, you know, if there's a bunch of people, it, it just, you know, a nice communal uh, uh, knowledge fest. Okay, so. All right. Uh, also, uh, one other thing. We go back to the three page. Um, there is how Zong uh, generated a little demo for updating. Uh, the SDK version uh, for your machine. Uh, Friday morning, if you were here, I uh, compiled my prototype and it failed because the SDK version on my laptop is older than the SDK version that I use on my main machine at home and uh, where I built the prototype. And so it failed and I had to go and each project I updated, you know, to, just to use the latest SDK that was on that machine, and it, then it worked. Uh, but uh, uh, instead of doing that, you can open the installer and install the later SDK, and that's what Howl's demo does. It shows you how to open it and just... So if you get one of those messages that says you know, the, that you know it fails to compile and there's a problem with the SDK, you can open the installer and just get the, last, the latest SDK for your machine. Simple, it's a... It's about a two-step process, really easy, and uh, I'll show you how to do that here. Okay, so um, uh, the agenda today is the main uh, uh, topic is uh, encapsulation, but we're going to do that very briefly. Uh, I want to talk about stuff related to Project One, mostly. Uh, we're going to talk about XML. We're going to talk about the XML processor. And uh, I will be talking about that on uh, the Friday morning help session as well. If you come to the Friday morning help session, do not bring chairs from another room into this room. 
A, that violates the fire regulations. B, last week, Dr. Gershoy had a meeting in 287, and he uh, went to this meeting, and there were no chairs. He had to reschedule this meeting. He was very gracious about it. If it was me, I would have been, uh, I would have been angry. Okay, so don't do that. Uh, if there aren't uh, seats available, just come back at 1030. I promise you I will be here. You know, what happens is I'll service the first wave from 9 till 1030. I will kick them out, and uh, then you can, you know. So if you come here and there aren't chairs, don't bring them from some other room. Okay. So... <clears throat> Uh, first of all, uh, I want to talk about some terms that we're going to use this morning. So encapsulation uh, means restricting access to a class or some kind of entity uh, uh, to a class of state uh, 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 to so that only member uh, functions of that class can access that state. And that way, that guarantees that the state, uh, if the class is properly designed, is always in a valid, uh, the state is always uh, valid. The state data is always in a valid condition. Uh, because only the member functions can change it. If you make it public, somebody else can come along and, and uh, do all kinds of crazy things to the data, and now it's invalid, and the member functions do totally wrong things because the data is invalid. So uh, you want to make, you want to keep data private, almost always. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that this morning, not a lot. I want to define some terms that we've been using. So some of this is in response to a, uh, a yeah, I suppose, a uh, student was saying, uh, I'm getting totally lost. You're clicking on so many links, I can't follow. You know, I don't understand the terms you're using. You're clicking on so many links, you're going so fast, you're leaving me in the dust. Okay, so uh, uh, I'm trying to define each of the terms I'm using. You're welcome to stop me if I go too fast. But I have also... Uh, one of uh, the students' complaints was that uh, there were so many links, they didn't know which ones I clicked on, and they were totally blown away. You've got so many links on your site. So what I've done is I've marked in yellow the links we're going to use today. Because other links, they're useful, you know, but the, one, the most important ones are the ones that are in these yellow. That's what we're going to look at today. So... SQL stands for Structured Query Language, and it's a formal language for extracting information from a database. And is used with relational databases. SQL database, a database structure with tables, and I should say, and relationships. Each record in the table is uniquely identified by a primary key, usually an integer, and tables are linked using foreign key relationships. It means that if this record in my table uh, needs information from another table, it includes the key. The primary key for that table is a foreign key in this table, so it uses that foreign key to identify that piece of information in the other, uh, other table that's linked. That's what relational databases do, and SQL sorts all that out. We're not doing that, but we're going to do something kind of similar. So uh, information is extracted using SQL. No SQL database, usually a key value store that identifies each value stored by its unique key. Voila, that's what we're doing, what the prototype does. Uh, it may have hierarchical relationships defined by key collections. Voila. That's what our child relationships are. Okay. I had the question in the class, uh, 8 o'clock class, somebody said, can you give me an example? You know, what's this relation? Well, what's all this about? So if we're using this database in a repository, which we will, a record describes a file. So 
if file A in the repository depends on file B and file C, then in file A's child collection, we'll find the key for file B and the key for file C. So those relationships are dependency relationships. So this file, the file described by this key depends on the files described by those child keys. Query, the extraction of records from a database that matches a specific set of conditions. Often a query may be made on a subset of records from the database defined by a previous query. Now, structured query language is all about making queries in relational databases. We're not going to try to reinvent uh, SQL for our database. Uh, you can't do it. SQL depends on the formalism of the relational model to work, and we don't have the formalism of the relational model. So, uh, but we're going to do something similar. Uh, so we would need to extract records from the database, and what that means is I'm going to get, when I find something, I'm going to get the keys for the records that match. So if I'm looking, so I make a query, give me, uh, I want to know all the records whose author, uh, first letter of the author's name is F. Or maybe the first three letters are F-A-W. Okay. So uh, uh, then I would get back the keys for each record in which I'm the author. Um, now, I might want to make a, I might want to know just, not just the files that, uh, for which I'm the author, but I want to just get the files for which I'm the uh, author that I've submitted this week. So now, I want to, out of that collection of my files, I want to query for those that were submitted this week. So I'll make a query on the keys that were returned by the first query. So a query typically starts with a key set and returns a key set. The first query starts with all the keys in the database. Uh, persistence, the act of saving database contents to a file, usually, usually binary or encoded in XML or JSON, we will use XML. And uh, the operation should be reversible, adding elements to the database from an encoded file. So, uh, so if I uh, create an empty database when I'm starting up the repository, for example, uh, uh, the database is empty, and now it needs to go and read all those XML files to, to load up all the records that describe data in the repository. Sharding, the act of saving a subset of the records of a database to a file. So. Um, we will demand that our uh, payloads have a collection called categories. So my payload will be a string, the path to a file. So the key will be a file name. The payload is the path to that file. And but the payload also contains a, a vector of categories. So category might be, this is display, or this is user interface. But it also might be threading or sockets. So it may well be that one file belongs to two categories. This is a, this belongs to the communication category, and it belongs to the socket category, and it belongs to the threading category. So while we may have subdirectories in our repository to store different kinds of files, uh, we can't use those uh, subdirectories to define categories unless we duplicate the files all over the place, and we don't want to do that. So, uh, so that's what, uh, now, so uh, sharding, uh, I might say, I want to save all the display files to this, uh, I want to save all the display records to this uh, display.xml. 
I don't want to save all the uh, UI records to UI.xml. Now, if I'm on the display, working on the display, and I start up uh, uh, the repository, I only want to look at the display files, maybe, and so I'll just load from that shard. I won't load up the whole database. For our projects, it won't be the uh, the, the database uh, it won't be big enough that it matters. It doesn't matter. Who cares? Let's load the whole thing. But if there's ten thousand records in the database, which a real one may very well have, if you don't shard, you're going to sit there and wait two minutes before anything happens while it loads, 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 loads all those ten thousand records. For somebody, it might not be two minutes, but some annoyingly long time. Okay. Okay. Now, I also want to just make a couple of quick comments about language types. Uh, you'll see why in a minute. Just bear with me. So, imperative languages are languages that command things, command your program to do specific things. Do this, do this, do this, do this. And examples are C, C++, Java, C Sharp. They're all imperative languages. Uh, Object-oriented languages are languages that use classes and class relationships to structure programs, but they typically are imperative programs too. So object-oriented programs are uh, languages are typically uh, a subset of the imperative language. Because they say, you know, do this, do this, do this. Functional languages, uh, language statements define functions and execute them. The whole program is a function that calls other functions, that calls other functions. And functions are first class objects. Uh, a function can be passed to another function, can be returned by the function. And very often, they operate on immutable data. So I define some data, and now if I want to change it, what I do is I create a new set of data. Uh, you know, if I want to add some data, then instead of adding it to that data, I create a new set of data uh, from the old, adding the new stuff. And that typically is done with recursive style programming. It's a very different style than we typically use. Uh, examples are Haskell, Lisp, parts of JavaScript work that way. Uh, but when we talk about functors and uh, lambdas, lambdas are first class uh, functions. I can pass a lambda to uh, another function or another lambda. I can return them. And I'm going to talk very uh, briefly about that. Declarative. Language statements declare the desired results, often in terms of conditions. Don't specify how those results are achieved. So imperative languages tell exactly how it's going to be done. Do this and this and this and this. Uh, a declarative language just says, give me this. Here's what I want. You go figure out how to give it to me. And that's what SQL does. SQL says select where. And we want to do something like that. Not going to be SQL, but you can imagine in our query module, so we create a package that holds as a data member a reference to the database, and it has a function select. And we want to call select display category. A display category is really a callable object, a function, or a lambda that pulls stuff out, you know, uh, uh, does, the, you know does the search over those keys, okay? So, uh, uh, so we want to develop a simple declarative language for getting information out of our database. Not SQL, but yeah, kind of the same spirit. Wouldn't hurt to have a select function. Okay. Everybody, anybody who's done database, you know, uh, relational database uh, uh, 
Mozart saying is smiling right now, okay? But you're used to that. So that's kind of where we're going. So examples of declarative languages are SQL. Regular expressions are uh, declarative. Prologue is a language that um, starts out with a set of relationships and it makes deductions about uh, those relationships. Some logic, logic programming. Okay, so uh, over the next uh, couple of weeks in the help sessions, I'm going to be talking about uh, queries and persistence. I'm not going to, I don't want to tell you too much. I've already given you a lot of help, but I, you know, I want to give you enough so that there's a path, you know, for you to follow. My goal is to give you a path to follow without putting a little yellow footprint on the rug each step of the way. Okay, so that's what I'm going to try to do. Uh, we're going to start that this morning. But first, we're going to talk about encapsulation. So. Uh, so I'm talking here about an information cluster, and I use that term because this idea applies to things more than just classes. It applies to classes, but it also applies to modules, which may be collections of multiple classes. It even applies to programs. So. The idea is this, that uh, this entity, whatever it is, a class or a, a package or a module, module is a collection of two or three packages, uh, uh, provides a set of public functions that are simple, well-named, so they describe what's going to happen when you invoke them, and they don't require design knowledge. For example, I don't want to pass them pointers or return pointers. Suppose I return pointer from a function. The caller now needs to know, when I'm done, do I call delete on this pointer or not? If I should and don't, I'll have a memory leak. If I shouldn't and do, I'll have an exception. That means I have to know the design of that entity. So we don't want to pat, we don't want to return pointers or pass pointers. However, down here inside in these private functions, these private functions may well require design knowledge. They're happy to, to accept and return pointers, if that makes sense. Because the public doesn't need to handle them. They don't have to ask those questions. But down here, it's just your public functions that are using these private functions, and they know. They know the design, because they're written by the designer. So the model is that I have uh, private functions are ones that require design knowledge to use. Private data is just data. No, I don't want anybody else to. I want only my functions, my public and private functions, to man manipulate so that I can guarantee the validity of uh, that data. Uh, so, and that's the, that's the whole idea. Now, with classes, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, we put the public functions in the public interface of the class. We put the private functions in the private interface. So the public interface, we say public colon colon functions, and then uh, private colon colon, uh, I'm sorry, uh, public colon functions and then private colon functions, and all those below the private are, guess what, private. They're not accessible uh, by clients of the class. Uh, you can do the same thing with modules, and I owe you a demo for that. I don't think I have a really good demo. It's used a lot, but I don't think I have a demo for it. Uh, one of my, I've asked one of my TAs to remind me with an email, and I will probably this weekend do a little demo, and we'll talk about it sometime real soon. 
private, just may post it and say, go look at it. Okay, so uh, all these words essentially say that. And again, the reason this was called an infor information cluster is it, a it applies to more than just classes. Uh, encapsulation is important for C programs that don't have classes. Now, I'll, I'll show you how all that happens. I'll, I'll do a little demo, but that's a story for another. Uh, there's an encapsulation presentation that I'm not going to walk you through. You know, it uh, uh, you know talks about quite a bit, you know, more stuff. You go take a look at it. It's fairly straightforward, easy to to do. Uh, I want to focus on uh, XML because you got to get ready to do the persistence. You need to know a little bit about how you manage that. So. So I invite you to go look at this encapsulation presentation, read it, and you know, ask questions about it in class on Thursday or whatever. Uh, I'm kind of constrained here a little bit. On Thursday, I'm going to begin talking about abstract data types. It's a really, really important topic uh, for this course. I'm going to do that on Thursday and the next Tuesday. By the time you're done, you will know an awful lot about the structure classes. Almost everything you need to know about the structure classes. So it's important that we get that done quickly. Uh, I need to talk to you uh, about XML and persistence. And I'm unfortunately, that couples into things like lambdas and functors that I haven't talked about. Uh, I will <coughs> soon. Okay, I'll do a little bit today, but, uh, but unfortunately C++ is big enough that, especially at the beginning, it's hard to talk about anything without using some terms that we haven't talked about yet. I hear you, Kay. So let's talk about XML. Let's start out with a lecture note. So this is a lecture note. This is a, actually a, a not quite complete example in the presentation as a complete example. But uh, uh, this will give you the idea. Uh, the main part of XML is uh, markup. And there's always one root. XML, the markup in XML is... Uh, has a single root. It's a tree, not a forest. Single root. So, and this root here is lecture note. Uh, there's an opening tag and a closing tag. The closing tag is, you know, tag is lecture note. Slash lecture note is a closing tag. And a uh, an element. So, uh, so a tag. Stuff in the middle and closing tag we refer to as an element. That's an XML element. Uh, an element, you know, here's a simple element. Here's a, a tag, title, closing tag, and just some text in between. But clearly, notice lecture note has a lot of markup in its element. You can have either text or markup in the, in the body of an element. So tag, body, Closing tag. Uh, I'm doing that from my point of view. From your view, it's tag, body, closing tag. Okay. No. Uh, uh, and the body can be just text, or it can be another element, or it can be both text and element. Here is a tag. Here is an element that has both text and markup. So. The John Strauss strip is the text, and note is a child element. So this is a text node and an element node. Um, uh, a, a tag can have attributes. So this, this tag has lecture note, course equals CSE 687. Uh, you can have zero or more attributes in a tag, in an element. 
and uh, they are uh, they have a name, attribute name, and an attribute value. The attribute name is not quoted. The attribute value is quoted. They're separated by an equal sign with no spaces. Some of the XML preprocessors will choke if there's a space between the uh, equal sign and the name and the value. Now, for us, this might be database. Record, 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 record. Don't say record one, record two, record three, record four. If you want all the records in the database, if you just name them record, I can say, give me all the records, bang, there they are. If you make them record one, record two, you're going to say, give me record one, give me record two, give me record three, give me record four. So don't do that. So it's database, record, 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 record. Now a record has a key and a value. So record tag, a record element, key element, key. Text name slash key. The value now has structure itself. So here's value, and then under value is name, date, uh, children, and then children has key, 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 key. Um, you know, you don't have to remember that. The particular format isn't important. You know, but that's the way you do it. So, you know, you want to change the order or, you know, modify that structure a little bit, that's up to you, that's fine. Because only your code has to read your, you know, we're not going to take somebody else's code and try to make it read your XML. We're not going to bring our own XML and make you read it. You're going to read your own XML. We may change your XML. So here's something we might do. Here you have your XML and you run it, it runs beautifully, and so we'll come in and we'll remove the closing tag. Okay. What happens? So we probably won't do that because we won't have time. We don't have enough. So that's uh, that's the model. Now let's talk about the specifics. Uh, when that is a process, it typically I don't know why this does such a lousy job of presenting this. The, the projector down in LSB did a pretty good job of showing all these lines, but these are so faint you can hardly see them. Can you guys see that? Is that okay? So what I had in that text was lecture note down, but there's typically other stuff. Uh, the stuff that comes, so this is the root of the XML, lecture note, or whatever. And the stuff that comes before it is called a prologue, and there can be stuff after it, like another comment, for example, epilogue. I have never written an XML file with an epilogue. I have never seen an XML file other than a little demo that I did. So I lied. I did, I did do a demo with a comment epilogue. But, but typically, prologues are what you see. Now, this is a declaration. This says to the XML processor, I promise you I am a well-formed XML. You may not keep the promise. You should. Your intent is to keep it. Uh, and you can have one or more, any number of comments you want, and then the lecture note. But all of this has to get tied together, held together for the processor, and that's typically done with a document note. So when you create a document, that node exists, but it doesn't have anything below it. And then you start adding stuff to the document. You add a declaration, you add a comment, you add... You might add a lecture note, and then to the lecture note, once you've added a document, I can add stuff to the lecture note element, you know, and it'll all be, you know, it's all chained together. So notice that uh, here's my author, and author has both text and a note, 
we saw, I showed you that in text, okay? So an element can have both a text node and a markup. And text is represented by a node, and uh, sometimes you need to know that, uh, by a text node. Um, notice uh, two, I have two titles here, title and title. So there's a title for the lecture note, but this reference points to a book. And so that book has a title. So I have two, and that's perfectly acceptable. You know, it's not badly formed XML because I've have the same tag at different levels, they just mean different things. Okay. Perfectly okay. And uh, not all XML processors generate this parse tree, but uh, the more sophisticated ones do. Uh, I have uh, an XML processor called XML Document that does this. I'm going to run it for you today. And uh, it's structured just like it builds this tree in memory, and it looks just like this. <clears throat> so now. XML has, let's go to the uh, PowerPoint. A little easier for me to tell. By the way, uh, some of these, I put these here, these are for me. Uh, the, the sum, like the, 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 uh, uh, the Visio uh, links. The college server won't serve them up. The college server has a white list of extensions that it will serve, and there's ones that won't. C sharp, it won't serve. The model is that that C sharp may describe the code for an application, and 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 making that visible to the outside world uh, provides an avenue of attack to that application. So it's a security problem, so they won't serve up uh, C sharp, but they serve up C plus plus just fine. God bless them. Uh, but anyway, XPath uh, and XSLT are languages that relate to XML. They're in the XML family. Uh, XPath is a uh, means of navigating, a language to navigate XML documents. So uh, uh, XML is a tree. Directory structures are a tree. We already have a language for navigating directories. Slash this, slash that. That's what XPath does. Is that slash language uh, for XML? Uh, I haven't implemented it with my processor, but, but XSLT is a functional language, a strange, quirky little functional language that is often used to uh, to turn XML into other things. One use is to turn it into a web page styled web page. I used to use that uh, uh, for uh, pages on my website. I, I, do, I don't do that anymore. It turned out to be kind of clumsy, didn't like that. So uh, It's also used to generate code. You could, uh, you could build an XML that described a, the elements. So let's say you're building a, a code wizard, a wizard to create a class and some empty methods and stuff like that. I could describe that in XML. Use XSLT to turn that into C or C sharp code or JavaScript. The kind of things that XSLT is using. I'm not going to talk about either XPath or XSLT. Uh, I say a little bit about it in these slides, and you're welcome to go look at it. So, uh, XML is extensible markup language. XPath and XSLT are, these are the words I just said. So. So uh, XML is a tag markup language desi designed to describe data, and uh, for some reason this uh, this link doesn't work, so I won't click on it. But it takes you to the something very like the lecture note. Uh, 
XML only has a couple of predefined tags. The, uh, the XML declaration starts with the XML tag, question mark XML, or XML, uh, question mark XML. So, uh, uh, but all the rest aren't defined. So XML is commonly used to define data structures, messages, and create web pages, but also it can be used to create languages. So for example, there is a consortium of companies that in this country that build medical information systems, the kind of things that your doctor's office uses to uh, uh, keep appointments and keep your medical records and stuff like that. And uh, uh, they wanted to be able to intercommunicate. So my doctor wants to refer me to a specialist, and so he's got to send my information to a specialist. He's using Epic, and the specialist is using some other medical information system. Okay. And so, how do they interrupt? Uh, how do they interoperate? Well, the answer is that this consortium got together and used XML to define a language for specifying medical information. And those are validated with something called a schema. The schema says, this document is a valid medical information document, or it is not. If I link to a schema on an XML page, and I process it with a smart processor, the processor will test the schema, and if it doesn't match, it'll stop and give you an error message instead of processing. My XML processor isn't smart enough to do that. I could have, but I wanted to build that XML processor in two weeks, not six months. Okay. What it would have taken to validate XML and you know, validate against schema. There's two methods. There's schemas and there's DTDs, document type definition. Do exactly the same thing, but they're two different languages. The schema is written in XML. DTD is written in a quirky little language that is not XML. And the reason for DTD's existence is when HTML was invented in 1990 or 1989, whenever it was that Tim Berners-Lee invented HTML, uh, XML didn't exist. And so they invented this quirky little language that are called DTD's, document type definition. And HTML is defined, H uh, uh, HTML5 is defined in terms of a DTD. When you say doc type at the beginning of an HTML page, that refers to a DTD. So, um, so but uh, most people outside of HTML use, uh, use schemas to validate documents. I'm not going to talk a lot about schemas. A schema says uh, you're allowed to use these tags, and this tag has to be followed by those tags, or, you know, or optionally, blah, 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 blah. It's that kind of stuff. So uh, validation uh, said so to be correct XML set of markup needs to uh, 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 needs only to be well formed to uh, so XML there's two kinds of well formedness this well formedness of the XML markup that means it satisfies some syntax relationships we're going to talk about uh, quickly this morning uh, the other form is that. Uh, this XML document satisfies the schema. So the XML fragment has to be syntactically correct. The document has to match a schema if you provided that link to the schema. So two notions of well-formedness. I'm going to talk about the, uh, the first. And I say, hey, uh, it uses document type definitions, GDDs, or schemas. Uh, here comes some of the syntax. So XML element uh, uh, have a tag star means zero or more. Zero or more attributes where you have an unquoted name, equal sign, no space, quoted value, no space, and you can have multiple ones, and they are separated by spaces. So I can have an attribute, space, attribute, space, attribute, where the individual attribute is name, no space, equal, no space, value, quoted value. 
So here, book author equals proceeds. So my XML processor can deal with attributes. It understands them and parses them. All parts of an element are Unicode text, typically uh, UTF-8. UTF-8 is very like ASCII, but not identical. The UTF specs are really interesting and complicated. There's a lot of stuff to consider when you get down to the details. You know, when you start using uh, Sanskrit characters or Chinese ideograms or Arabic curly, squirrely stuff, uh, UTF was designed to let you manage all that. There's a lot of stuff going on. Uh, I'm no expert with that, but there's some nice specs. Fortunately, I know of one, and I didn't provide a link to it, but if I think about it, I will. XML names are composed of Unicode characters. Tag names must begin with a, uh, a letter or underscore. Other tag name characters may contain characters, underscores, digits, hyphens, and periods. Very like names in C++ or C Sharp. Same kind of rules. Names may contain neither. They may not contain spaces, and they may not start with a string XML or any case variant of XML. Attribute names must follow the same rules as tag names and are also required to be unique within the tag which where they're, they're embedded. So I can have the, uh, the attribute name of uh, uh, student, and I can only have that student attribute occur once in an element. But it can occur in many elements of my document. It's just that it has to be unique in the one out, and each element must have a unique set of attribute names. In child elements, so that element can't include that same attribute. No, they can, because it's a different element. So that's a good question. I see what you mean, yeah. but no, it's considered to be a different element. So it has to be. So when I have that opening tag, angle bracket, name, attributes, closing, it's in that opening tag that they have to be unique. Uh, element bodies may contain plain text or markup or both. Markup text uh, is text uh, with embedded markup characters. And they cannot occur in text, in the body text. If they occur, they're going to be uh, processed as if they were markup. So, you know, what, so how do I describe XML in an XML document? Like a schema. Uh, and there's two answers to that. One is I can use a C data section. So angle bracket, explanation part, you know, C data. This dot, dot, dot is what's going in the C data. This is the payload for the C data section. And it ends with bracket, bracket, straight to that. I'm not going to have any markup characters I want in here. And they, what that does is it tells a processor, do not interpret this as markup. My uh, XML processor is not, not smart enough to use C data. I don't think I did. I'm, I'm pretty sure that I never got around to, to doing that. Uh, but you may look at this and say, hey, uh, great, I can pass binary data in my XML. Wrong. Because somewhere in the middle of that binary data, there might be exactly the right bytes to look like bracket, bracket, greater than. And then the Processor would terminate the C data section and start to get all go crazy trying to handle all those other binary bits. So what that means is, if you want to encode, if you want to pass binary data in XML, you can, but you have to put it in character form. So I can convert it to hex, or I can do a base sixty four encoding. And uh, most people use base sixty four encoding because it's a little more compact than uh, than hexadecimal. And there's a uh, I have a little program fragment on the on the college server that does uh, base 64 encoding. We won't need to do that. 
Uh, the Alternately, instead of using a C data section, I can simply, whenever I have an angle bracket I don't want to be interpreted as markup, I just say ampersand LT semicolon. This is an escape sequence. Same thing for greater than, same thing for ampersand, same thing for apostrophe, same thing for quote. And if you look at my web pages, you'll see me use those. For example, in the code snaps, for template class, I have the angle brackets. The pound includes, I have the angle brackets. Uh, they're not being treated as markup for the HTML because I have ampersand less than, ampersand greater than. I wrote a little program called Webifier that processes code, and all it does is it, it puts a pre-tag, pre-opening tag, pre-closing tag, which means render this with all the spacing the way it's, you see it in the text. Don't change any of the white space. Don't flow the white space around. And uh, then inside the body, wherever there's the markup characters, I just change them to their escape sequences. That's what my wire does. It lets me put up what page, uh, code on what page is really easy. <coughs> XML document, so now we were talking about XML syntax, now we're talking about the document structure. XML document is defined by a standard opening. Now this turns out processing instructions are instructions that have no closing tag. They have exactly the structure. Uh, a while back I went and looked at the standard and the standard goes to great pains to say the declaration is not a processing instruction. There is no other way you can distinguish it from everything it uh, does and contains is exactly what's allowed in the processing instruction. My own mental model is if it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it ought to be a duck. Okay? But the standard didn't agree with me. This is a this is a declaration. So anyway, but I will refer to them as processing instructions. Uh, uh, the banner Comments don't have any closing. Comments done this way. I mean, this closes the comment, but as an XML markup, there is no closing tag. And occasionally we'll put in processing instructions that are not to be interpreted as data. They're just instructions to the processor to process it this particular way. So, a well-formed XML document has these rules. There may be only a single root. Uh, this in, this, actually, this applies to both. Everything I've said here applies to both XML fragments, well-formed syntax, and documents. Uh, uh, they may only have a single root. All tags except for processing instructions must be closed. And you can close them this way, or they can be self-closed, just a single a tag that's self-closing tag, okay? In this case, all the information is conveyed by the name of the tag and this attribute. That's a lot of cases where that's all you need. Attribute values must be quoted. XML tags are case sensitive, so that means uh, Jim with a capital J and Jim with a lowercase j are two different tags, meaning two different things. All markup and payload is text, uh, with one exception, C data sections, which we already talked about. And this page talks more about C data, so let's skip it. Uh, XML document is well-formed XML if it contains a prologue, uh, optionally links to an XSLT style sheet to turn it into something else. We won't do any of that. An optional reference to a DTT or schema, we won't do any of that. Optional processing instructions, we won't do any of that. Optional comments, you probably ought to. A body with a single root, an optional epilogue consisting of comments and processing instructions. So that's a well-formed XML document. When you persist uh, your database, probably a good idea to include the XML banner, but you're not obligated to. It'll work just fine without. This is Fragment, but it's not a bad idea to include the banner. By banner, I mean this thing, the declaration.
So uh, processing instructions has this syntax, question mark, target, attribute value. Boy, that looks like the declaration, doesn't it? <laughs> standard says this is not a processing instruction. The, the standard says the declaration is not. So this is the, you know, this is the declaration. So anyway, uh, namespaces, I am not going to talk about. Namespaces, other than the, the following couple of words, uh, namespaces are used for the same purpose that namespaces are in code. Uh, if I have several teams that are collaborating on a large XML document, this team may define a tag that means one thing, and this team uses the same tag name to mean something else. How do we disambiguate that? We do it with namespaces. Same kind of thing we do with code. Uh, the, the rules are a little more complicated than they are for code, and uh, almost most documents aren't developed by teams. You know, they're developed by one or two people working together. So, uh, uh, you know, if you're interested, if I were needed to use namespaces in my documents, you know, you step out of here and go to work, you may have to. I would. It would take me about a morning or maybe even all day to get all the rules, to remember all the rules and get them right again up here, okay? Because uh, they're a little complicated. But, you know, just... Here's my example. So here's the, the, this is what we looked at, but this completes it. Here's the, here's the declaration, here's the comment, you know, and the lecture note. So, and here I have shown the uh, lecture note parse tree uh, without the text nodes and any other decoration, just to keep it simple so you can see the structure. But here's the whole parse tree. This is what uh, my processor builds in, uh, you know, virtually any other DOM-based processor. A document, and then these uh, declarations and comments. Here's the lecture note. Here's all these nodes. I've marked these as A if they have an attribute. So that A just means that this has an attribute. That's all I mean. Okay. Uh, XML can be presented in a bunch of different ways. One way is on a web page, uh, uh, HTML has an XML tag. And what that means is that in between the opening and closing XML tag, I can put XML. That is not rendered by the browser. But I can have JavaScript, a JavaScript function that goes and interprets that, you know, parses that, and does stuff on the web, uh, XML page based on what's in that XML. One, here's a typical scenario. Uh, I have a web page that uh, puts out information, that contains in one part of it information that changes every day. And I, I can get that information from a web service. I don't want to re-handcraft that page every single day. So what do I do? I have XML, and that XML can just be a template. And I have JavaScript. It goes and reads the web service, and then fills in the template, and renders it. And so you see it. Okay? And now... Nobody has to doctor that page every day. It just happens. It's updated. Cool. There's other ways to do it, you know. But that's one way. Uh, now this set of notes begins to talk about XPath and XSLT. And, you know, we're not going to use those things this semester. You can look at them or not as you choose. Now, what I want to do is run my version of this. So if you go and look at, I'm on the college server, so if you go and look at uh, Project One Help Spring, you'll find XML document. And uh, this is my XML processor. Now, I'm going to run it off my machine, so let me just, so this is an old web page. Uh, did I show you the, I, I, at the beginning of class, I showed you the Office of Hours page, didn't I? So, um, let me just pull up. Now, 
Now, uh, where I want you to get this, notice I want you to go, Project 1 helps Spring 18. I guarantee you that this stuff will be the current code. I have an awful time with configuration management. I, I, I've been reckless about where I put stuff. I'll put copies of stuff all over the place. And I'll remember to get those two places updated, and I'll forget that those two places aren't updated. And so and I'm constantly having students pull down old code and say, hey, what's going on? You know, I fixed a bug, and they report the bug again. So, uh, but if you go to the project uh, one help spring 18, S18, or for project two, project two help, guaranteed they'll be up to date. I will keep them up to date. I am also putting, uh, I have a bunch of repositories in each class, which I'm going to get rid of. I'm going to move everything to one single repository at the top level, but it's going to take me a while. So until I tell you the repository is now well formed, guys, until that happens, don't go there. Go to the Project One Help or follow the links on the, on the web pages. But, you know, the best place is to go to the Project One Help. So I don't have that. I, I, I forgot to upload that stuff from my, uh, to this machine, from my work machine. So I don't have that XML document in my Project One Help. So I am going to go to the repository uh, and pull up XML documents. So this is an SU repository, CPP. No promises that this will be up to date on the college server. Don't promise that. You know, go to the Project One, bring whatever. So I have X uh, document and X element. Let's look at X element. So X element has an abstract XML element base class. And I am using shared pointers. This is provided by, as of C++11, a smart pointer uh, provided by the standard library. And that smart pointer, you don't have to call delete on it. When it goes out of scope, it deletes its content. It's reference counted. That's why it's called a shared pointer. So if I have two shared pointers pointing to the same object, when one goes out of scope, basically there's a reference count. It decrements the reference count. When this guy goes out of scope, it decrements the reference count. If the reference count goes to zero, the object kills itself. It calls delete on this. So, uh, so I'm using shared pointers, uh, and I will talk. I owe you some a little bit of conversation real soon about two things. To understand this thoroughly, you have to understand shared pointers, and you have to understand lambdas. Uh, I also have a very tight agenda here. On Thursday, I'm going to talk about abstract data types, and on Tuesday, I'm going to finish abstract data types. That's the most important lecture, a pair of lectures, in the whole course, and it has to happen now. So I can't stop. So as soon as that's done, on Thursday of next week, I will talk about shared pointers. I'll talk about lambdas and functors and all the related stuff. And I'll go back and look at this example again. I think you could use it without understanding all that mechanic, me mechanism. But uh, you'll notice that there is an uh, abstract element that has an add child, remove child, add attribute, remove attribute. Uh, it, uh, you can get the children in a vector of smart pointers, uh, you can get the tag, you can get the value, uh, you, can, uh, you can convert uh, that element to a string representation of the element. So uh, it gives you lots of stuff. Now, um, there is a doc element. This is the guy that sits at the very top. Okay, so he, uh, uh, so in 
this abstract element, notice it's uh, some of these are equal zero. That's these are pure virtual functions. This says that this class does not provide definitions of these. And as a consequence, the compiler, if you try to create an instance of this, the compilation will fail, it'll say these methods aren't defined. So what, you'll, what you do is you create the child elements, and one of the child elements is a doc element. You don't need to create that because that's just part of my implementation. Uh, there is a text element. That's a text node. There is a tagged element. That's all the stuff we're typically used to using, okay? And there is a comment element, and there's a processing instruction element. Those are the elements in my element hierarchy, and almost always you'll just be concerned about text elements and tagged elements. And uh, now let's take a look at the document interface. So let's go to XML document.h. <coughs> so there is a constructor that takes a pointer. Uh, if you give it a pointer to the root of XML, then it makes that document point to that XML root. But uh, by default, there's no pointer. You just, you know, nothing, nothing attached. Uh, there is an XML document that you can build from a string. If I have a string representation, like lecture note for that whole thing, you can build it from that string. Uh, this is, uh, this delete says you can't make copies of this probably makes sense not to copy XML documents. They're probably pretty big things. Uh, one of the reasons that is uh, not copyable is that I'm using shared pointers and you can't copy shared pointers. Uh, assignment is deleted. I have move operations and uh, on, uh, starting on Thursday and continuing on Tuesday, it'll be really clear what copy and move operations and assignments are all about, okay? So just bear with me. That's coming, to, that's coming next, uh, 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 in two days. So uh, I can get the doc element. I can get to that very top document if I want, okay? So to, uh, you know, to poke at his children and look at his children and stuff like that. Uh, I can get the XML root. First thing that he holds, okay. Most of these you don't really need to, you probably won't be using. Uh, now I can uh, now I can make queries. So element gets the First child. Elements um, so uh, so here I have a collection that's held internally called found as a result of queries. So when I call element, found zero contains the first element with a tag, with that tag name. When I call elements, found contains all the children of the first element with that tag. So elements are children. When I call that, that's just stored in found, and I don't see anything until I access found. That's the perk of my design. Descendants, this is what you'll use most. So I, I can give a tag name if I want to, and this will, if I give it a tag name, it goes to that tag name, and it finds 
it includes, if my memory serves me right, it includes that tag, all his children, all his grandchildren, all his great grandchildren, all his up, 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 all the way down. So you get a collection of all those nodes. Uh, here's the find function that lets you go find a particular tag. Uh, you can ask uh, how many uh, how many uh, uh, elements do you have in the XML uh, document? This is a really a note count. Uh, I can I can take this document. If I modify the document, now I can generate a string representation of that document, and I can save it to a file. Okay, uh, and here depth first search. So here's what's going on here, and this is why, you know. So let's look at this. Let me talk, talk to you about this. We go until, I have seven more minutes. Is that right? Oh, boy. So notice this function depth first search walk. It has a sub-template, okay, uh, call object. And what this is doing is this is doing a depth first search walk down the XML parse tree, applying to each element call object. Call object is a callable object. It could be a function pointer, but just process, it just calls that function on each element that it finds. But it could be a functor. Functor is a class. That implements operator paren. That's the code that's executed. And it has data members. That's data that's used in the execution of that function. And so if I pass it a functor, a functor can accumulate as you walk down the tree, it can, can commu uh, accumulate information that you're gathering. And then when it's all done walking, you can go to that functor and say, give me that information. So it's a very general, wide open, you know, and typically we'll pass lambdas into this call object. And again, I owe you a conversation real soon about functors and lambdas. All right, so um, I'm going to stop here and just show you a tiny bit about functors and lambdas. Uh, I will uh, Friday morning in the help session Friday morning. I will run this for you. We'll talk about it a little more. My goal for Friday morning is to do two things: to show you this XML processor a little bit. I have simpler XML reader, XML writer that don't build the DOM. They just do string, they do a string walk, but they're not nearly as powerful. They don't know what an attribute is. They, you know, so if you have any attributes you don't use, they won't work. So, uh, but if you, if you keep things really simple, you can use the XML reader and writer if you want. But XML document is the preferred way. I will run this for you in the help session, and then I'll talk a little bit about query stuff. Again, you know, I'm not going to paint yellow footsteps, each footstep on the rug to get you to a full query, but, um, you know, I want to point the direction to you. Uh, if you come to the help session, you know, there are going to be two waves, one at 9 o'clock, one at 10.30. Do not bring chairs in from other rooms so that you can sit in that first session. People did that last week, and Dr. Gershoy had a meeting in 287, and he walked in from the meeting, there weren't any chairs. He had to cancel his meeting. Do not. He was, you know, he was very kind about that, but if it was me, I would have been grumbling, you know, I thought that was a matter of stuff. No. Don't do that. I promise you I will be here at 1030. I'll kick everybody out at 1030 and welcome you in. So if you come, there is an existing chair already here. One of those pink chairs. 
We'll do a survey. If it ain't pink, it goes out. Okay. So if you're not sitting in a pink chair, uh, you know, you'll be asked to leave, but you come back at 1030 and there'll be plenty of pink chairs for you to sit in. Uh, so let me quickly, you owe me, guys, don't get restless. Don't get restless. You owe me five more minutes. I will run this for you Friday. We'll talk about it a little bit. But what I want to do is do this. If you go up to the notes section, you'll find course summary. And let's expand C++ language. And let's go down. Here's functors. Here's a quick description of what a functor is. So a functor is a class that implements operator paren. And it can store data. And I give it the data perhaps in a constructor call. And what happens is here I'm declaring this is class a functor. I've declared an instance of a functor. No, this is no, nothing special about this name. This could have been foobar. Uh, so here I've declared an instance of my functor. Uh, I declared some y to pass to it. Okay, so notice that operator paren accepts a y. So I declared an instance of y. And now I said func y. It looks like a function call. That's why we call it a functor. The code that's executed when I call this like a function is all the code implemented by operator paren. And it, but it may use any functions like x that it's hold on, that it got in a constructor call or some other number function call to participate in that code evaluation. Okay. So I can pass it, so I could pass a functor, I could design a functor that does something interesting on all the nodes in that parse tree into depth first search walk, because it accepts a callable object. And a functor is a callable object because it implements operator print. Now, a lambda is a shorthand way of defining a functor. Here is a lambda. It starts here and goes to here. That's a lambda. Now, my comment runs off the screen, but uh, the compiler, when the compiler sees a bracket and an empty space before it, it says, oh, this isn't an indexer, this is a lambda. If I have equals in here, it says, any values that I, so what happens is this lambda, notice this lambda uses message. Message is defined in its local scope. It's just, it was a calling argument in that function, make lambda. So what's happening is the compiler is building a functor whose operator paren implements this code. And it has member data that was used here. So message becomes a piece of member data in that functor, and uh, and operator paren implements that code. So it's just a shorthand way of writing a functor, but it's real quick, done locally. And so I can the first search walk to find a little functor right in my call. Oh, you know, there we go. We use functors all. Uh, we use lambdas all the time. They're really useful. You'll see them a lot in my code. So if you look at the main of my XML document where I'm you know, trying to illustrate how you use it, you'll see me using functors. I have test this, test this, test this, test this, and those test functions are using functors. I'll talk more, see more about functors. We'll come back to it, try to get you really comfortable with it because it's really powerful, you're going to use it a lot. Okay, I'm done. You can get up and leave. Thank <laughs> you.